Shakespeare, the Bard, the playwright who shaped English theatre as well as becoming the bane of high school English students. Due to his mysterious life, it is often debated exactly how many plays Shakespeare worked on in his lifetime, with several collaborations and lost plays being hotly debated by historians. However, there is no debate about Vortigern and Rowena, the last play that turned out to be nothing more than an elaborate forgery. During the 1700s, many people tried to compile a complete biography of Shakespeare. While his plays were widely available and loved by the public, the man himself was still kind of a mystery. Anyone who attempted to piece together the fragments of his life found nothing but rumour and hearsay, of a man who seemingly became famous all around England, out of nowhere. One of these men was Samuel Ireland, a collector of historical relics. While working on his book, Warwickshire Avon, he passed through Shakespeare's hometown of Stratford-upon-Avon. Stratford's economy was based on people visiting the birthplace of the Bard, even to this day, its major attractions are all based on relics of his life. It was Samuel's book that introduced the public to Shakespeare's Crabtree and Mary Arden's Cottage, two things that still hold pride of place in any visitor's guide to the town. Samuel planned to use this visit to inquire about documents relating to Shakespeare, hoping to add them to his ever-growing collection. However, these documents seemed to elude him at every turn. A ray of hope came when Samuel learned that during the demolition of Shakespeare's last house, the new place, all of the documents had been gathered up and moved to Clopton House for safekeeping. Samuel dashed to Clopton House, hoping that he would find what he was seeking there. Alas, when he arrived, he was told that all of the documents from the new place had been burnt, Samuel was devastated by this revelation. While it would turn out to be nothing more than a joke at the collector's expense, this devastation had quite the effect on Samuel's son, William Henry Ireland. William was fascinated with the book Love and Madness by Henry Croft, specifically the book's passages on the forger Thomas Chatterton. And thus, with a desire to please his father, William decided to start forging. Luckily for William, he met a man in a bookbinder's who explained how to simulate historic paper by writing on it with a special ink and then heating the paper over a candle flame. This technique would allow William to make his first documents. These documents turned out so well that in the December of 1794, William set about making a document that bore William Shakespeare's signature. William's job at a legal firm gave him access to various Elizabethan and Jacobean deeds. William took one of these documents and cut out part of the parchment and used the ink technique to create a mortgage deed. On the one side, this document was between Michael Fraser and his wife. However, on the reverse, this document was between Shakespeare and John Hemmings. This was a logical choice, as Hemmings was an actor in The King's Men, a theatrical company which Shakespeare wrote for, and Hemmings was also the editor of the first folio of Shakespeare's works. William copied Shakespeare's signature from a 1612 mortgage deed. William would say that he got this signature from a book written by Johnson Stevens. However, the specific deed was not actually in that book, and in fact came from a book by the Irish Shakespeare scholar Malone. There are reasons why William may not want to credit Malone, which you'll find out later. To make this fake document look even more authentic, William removed a seal from another deed and attached it to his fake one. When William presented this to his father on the 16th of December, Samuel accepted it as genuine. He even took it to the Herald's office, who failed to see through the forgery. Of course, Samuel was a collector. 
he was curious as to just how William had acquired this document. William quickly made up a story, saying that he had found the document in an old trunk belonging to a chance acquaintance. William said that this acquaintance didn't wish to be named and thus only referred to him as Mr. H. To sweeten the story, William said that there may be more documents in that trunk and quickly produced a second forgery, this time of a promissory note from Shakespeare to Hemmings. His confidence buoyed by this success, William moved on to more involved creations. At a party, William overheard one of his father's friends mention that Henry Reesley, the third Earl of Southampton, was one of Shakespeare's patrons. William started to furiously research with the aim of making a correspondence between the Earl and Shakespeare. This correspondence ended up reading, Dost not esteem me a sluggard, nor tardy for thus having delay to answer, or rather to thank you for your great bounty, said Shakespeare, only for the Earl to reply back with, Gratitude is all I have to utter, and that is too great and too sublime a feeling for poor mortals to express, O oh my lord. It is a bud which blossoms blooms but never dies. As I have been thy friend, so I will continue, at that I can do for thee. Pray command me, and you shall find me. Yours, Southampton. Please note the complete lack of any form of punctuation. This will become important later on. Once again, William was met with questions. Specifically, how did these two letters end up in the same collection? Very rarely do you end up with the sent and received letter together, unless the writer and receiver were a couple. William said that Shakespeare's letter was merely a copy of the one he sent. Because as we all know, the major undercurrent of all of Shakespeare's works is that good record keeping really is key. When Samuel and his friends looked over the letters, they admired the style, but they were not fans of the Earl's penmanship. See, despite his research, William hadn't realised that there were records of the Earl's writing still in existence, and thus had merely written the Earl's text with his left hand. However, William continued to produce more documents, and these documents grew in scope. The next batch was the Holy Grail for Shakespeare collectors. It included a profession of faith and a letter from Queen Elizabeth. Off note was a letter to fellow actor Richard Cowley. This letter came with a sketch of Shakespeare, drawn by the Bard's own hand, proving that while the Bard was a good writer, he was not a good draftsman. In reality, William Ireland had used an engraving by Martin Drauschout that was made several years after Shakespeare's death, and it's debatable how much this engraving resembled the living man. However, by far the most exciting part of this collection was a group of plays. There was a manuscript of King Lear that was apparently meant for the press, which included annotations by Shakespeare himself, a few loose pages of Hamlet, and two previously unheard of plays. Henry II and Vortigern and Rowena. William announced the discovery of these new papers and the unpublished plays on December 26, 1794, but he didn't produce the manuscript until the March of 1795. When he produced the manuscript, William paired it with a letter from Shakespeare, explaining why the play was unpublished. See, William Ireland was worried that some descendant of Shakespeare would come in from the wings and try and claim the fake play, just like a twist from the Bard's own works. So William Ireland produced a fake deed that gave the family ownership, as well as explaining how such a thing could happen. According to the deed, an ancestor of theirs had saved Shakespeare from drowning, leading to Shakespeare willing all of the manuscripts to the family. Due to either amazing luck or outrageous cockiness, this ancestor was also called William Henry Ireland. 
Of course, the prospect of a new Shakespeare play caught the attention of the theatre world. Thomas Harris of Covent Garden expressed an interest in the play, but the islands eventually sold it to Richard Brinsley Sheridan of the Drury Lane Theatre. Sheridan paid the islands £300 and promised them half the revenue, which would have been a small fortune if the play had done well. And well, now I've said that, I think you can guess where this is going. Cracks very quickly started to form. Letters are easy to fake, but a full play? That's a whole different story, especially when the writer has a voice as distinct as Shakespeare's. When Sheridan read the play, he remarked that it seemed much simpler than Shakespeare's previous works. Even the male and female lead had issues with the play. John Philip Kemble, who was also the Drury Lane's manager at this time, doubted the authenticity of the play heavily. The female lead was meant to be Sarah Siddons, however, she quit a week before the play opened. Her reason was never fully disclosed, but it is suspected that Kemble turned her opinions against the play. She would be replaced by Jane Powell in time for the first night, something that proves that people thought this play would do well. Miss Powell was not one to do plays that were doomed to fail. However, this was not the only issue. Samuel Ireland decided to publish the letters and other bits despite William's protests. Eventually, William was able to convince him to not publish Henry II and Vortigern. When the book was released in the December of 1795, it generated a lot of interest but would cause William a lot of issues. Sure, he had been able to pull off fooling people in small groups in person, but now the texts were available everywhere and every scholar had plenty of time to pore over every single detail. A little bit after publication, the Ireland's neighbour, Albany Wallace, found an authentic John Hemming signature, and it looked nothing like the one William had made. William acted quickly and soon produced a Hemming signature that resembled the one Wallace had found. William explained away the issue by saying that there must have been two actors by the name of John Hemmings, both of whom lived at the same time, worked in the same circles, and were both friends with Shakespeare. While this sounds like an amazing lie now, it was enough to put Wallace off the scent. However, it did not take long for responses to be published in the public domain, and very few of them were positive. On the 16th of January, 1796, James Bowden published a letter to George Stevens. In this, Bowden focused on the manuscript of Lear and noted that if it was Shakespeare's personal copy, then Shakespeare had apparently lost the ability to write, and also noted that this manuscript proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that Shakespeare couldn't spell. The Irish Shakespeare scholar, Edmund Malone, published an inquiry into the authenticity of certain miscellaneous papers and legal instruments on March 21st, 1796. To say Malone decimated the forgeries is frankly underselling the sheer volume of complaints he made about the documents. He left no nit unpicked in his 400-page literary smackdown. Remember earlier when I said, despite his research, William hadn't realised there were records of the Earl's writing still in existence? Malone jumped on this, comparing actual samples of the Earl's handwriting with the forged versions showing that this could not have come from the Earl's hand. Malone also compared Queen Elizabeth's handwriting to the handwriting found on her letter and found that the penmanship was totally different. Someone like Queen Elizabeth didn't change her handwriting very often. She always had to look her best. When you rule an empire, you can't afford a day of bad cursive. So a dramatic change like the one Malone saw was total proof that something was wrong with these letters. He also decimated the spelling and grammar, pointing out that the grammar was not only wrong for Shakespeare's time period, but it was wrong for any time period. 
a lot of the words were used in a different manner in Shakespeare's time, and several words just hadn't been invented at the time the letters were supposedly written. This was butchered ye olde English that was only fit to be in a terrible fantasy novel. But the most damning was the list of historical inaccuracies. The biggest of which was a letter that referenced the Globe Theatre several years before it had actually been built, proving without a shadow of a doubt that the documents were a modern concoction. This, at its core, was the issue. William was a good forger and had learned a lot of history from his father. However, when against actual scholars who had records and archives at their disposal, William was out of his depth. Despite this, the play would open on April 2nd, 1796 at the Drury Lane Theatre. This was the hot ticket event of the year. It was near impossible to secure yourself a seat. If the performance had gotten a good reaction, it might have been able to save the scheme or at least tilt the public against Malone. However, as you can likely guess, this wasn't to be. The audience seemed excited at first, but soon fits of laughter broke out amongst the crowd. This laughter got so intense that the play had to be stopped until the audience were able to get themselves under control. The most famous part of the performance came when Kemble repeated the line, and when this solemn mockery is o'er, twice, something that was seen by many as him voicing his opinion on the play's authenticity. The play did so badly that when a second date was announced, the audience went into chaos and refused to calm down until the play was swapped out for another. Imagine that. A play that is so hated, the audience riot at the mere idea of a second showing. An audience that refuses to calm down until a different play is subbed in. Unsurprisingly, the play's opening night was also its last night making it a member of a very small club. Samuel Ireland blamed Kimball for the failure of the play, as well as a Malone faction who sided with Malone's opinion of the documents. However, most people were of the opinion that the play was bad at best and unwatchable at worst. So what was the problem with Vortigern and Rowena? Well, to discuss that, we actually need to summarise what the play was about. The play pulled from English folklore, with the legendary King Constitus offering half his crown to his advisor Vortigern in return for loyal service. The real Constitus was co-emperor of the Roman Empire, so this made sense. In traditional Shakespearean form, Vortigern immediately starts plotting to murder the king and get all of the crown for himself, something that he pulls off with relative ease. At the same time, the court fool warns Vortigern's children, Pacintius and Flavia, of bad times ahead, and they decide that of all the people in the court, the most trustworthy person is, of course, the professional idiot, and decide to leave the castle with the fool in tow. This escape is pulled off by the Shakespearean tradition of Flavia dressing in drag. In Rome, Constitus's children, Aurelius and Uta, hear word of Vortigern's treachery and decide to leave Rome and go to Scotland to raise an army in an attempt to avenge their father. Upon hearing this, Vortigern summons his own army of Saxons to defend himself. This army is led by Hengist and Horus. In a move straight out of a rom-com, Vortigern falls in love with Hengist's daughter, Rowena, and proclaims her his queen. This sounds wonderful, aside from the fact that Vortigern is already married, and his wife isn't best pleased by this turn of events. She and Vortigern's two remaining sons, Wartimus and Cartagirius, flee, likely already seeing the writing on the wall. All of Vortigern's family join Aurelius and Uta's army, and Aurelius falls in love with Flavia. As is the tradition in such plays, Aurelius defeats Vortigern, but spares him, leaving the Fool to come to centre stage to give the final line of the play. The Fool points out that the play isn't very tragic because 
none save the bad do fall, which draws no tear. Now during this summary, you might have picked up on something. The play sounds like a lot of other Shakespeare plays. Now the bard wasn't afraid of using repeated motifs, but this almost feels like a greatest hits collection. The jukebox musical of Shakespeare plays. There are bits of Macbeth, Hamlet, Much Ado and the histories all bundled into one. It feels like someone trying to imitate Shakespeare, missing the spark that made his plays actually enjoyable. Malone's faults are magnified here. The language and flow just aren't the same as Shakespeare's. While it is easy to miss this or brush over it in a letter, when performed on stage it becomes very clear that this isn't the Bard's work and was written by a totally different person. After the abject failure of the play, critics started to accuse Samuel of faking the whole thing, causing his book sales to tank. William confessed the deceit to his mother and sisters, however Samuel refused to listen to him. He believed that all of the papers were totally genuine. He was so convinced of this fact that he edited and published the play in 1799, even including a foreword where he blamed and attacked Malone's findings. Samuel laid all of the blame at Malone's feet and dedicated himself to writing a book that would destroy the scholar's reputation. With help from Thomas Caldecott, Samuel published Investigation, where he attacked Malone for using forensic techniques rather than relying on his sense of aesthetics and taste, an argument that I can't see holding much weight at the time. And it holds even less now, frankly. In essence, Samuel believed that Malone should accept the plays because they resemble Shakespeare, not really caring if they were Shakespeare. William tried to salvage his father's reputation and tried to beat him to the punch with a book of his own. However, he was only able to publish a pamphlet. This pamphlet was released in 1805 and entitled Confessions, where William took credit for all of the deception and all of the forgeries. Alas, this pamphlet just made people very suspicious of both of the islands. Many people accused them of collusion, including George Stevens, who said, The hopeful youth takes on himself the guilt of the entire forgery, and strains hard to excupulate his worthy father from the slightest participation in it. The father, on the contrary, declares that his son had not sufficient abilities for the execution of so difficult a task. Between them, in short, there is a pretend quarrel, that they may not look as if they were acting in concert on the present occasion. William moved to France to avoid the controversy. However, upon his return to England in 1832, he tried to publish the play as his own work. However, it received little to no attention, and it did nothing to undo the scandal. Samuel's reputation never recovered. Two accounts, one in 1859 by Clement Mansfield Ingleby, and one by George Dawson in 1888, took the opinion that Samuel was involved in the forgeries and knew full well that the documents were fake from the very start. It wasn't until 1876 that there was a ray of hope. The British Museum acquired Samuel Island's papers and produced evidence that he was totally oblivious to the whole affair and that he had no idea that William was making these documents in an attempt to please him. Alas, it couldn't rejuvenate his career. And Vortigern and Rowena is now merely a footnote in the Bard's legacy. One of many plays that bore his name despite not coming from his hand. However, Vortigern has had a slight renaissance, with many Shakespeare festivals performing the play as both an interesting historical curiosity and as a way of showing just how hard it is to write a Shakespeare play, and how easy it is to make something that, while it resembles Shakespeare, doesn't work as well as his actual plays. However, the play is still as terrible as it always was, so while I recommend seeing it, do go in prepared.